panelists. Bruno, you look very good in the mini movie there. Um, so aligning with financial standards, auditing, impact measurement and performance. Sounds a bit dry. What are we actually asking the panel to discuss this afternoon? If you think about it, an awful lot of effort and attention over the last 10 years has been focused around building a common language or at least a commonly understood diverse language to define impact investing and to map the spectrum from the lighter touch do no harm right through to investing in specific solutions or mission type investing as we've just been listening to. I think we'd all agree we've come a long way and many of you have been on that journey the whole time. So it has brought greater clarity about what it is that stakeholders would like to be measured. But the challenge now is to actually arrive at standardized impact measurement and processes using comparable data. So we need some workable version of this to be able to measure performance and to be able to assess return from different investment options. To state the obvious, Reported information needs to be consistent across time period, to be reliable, comparable, and fit for use in order for it to be useful. So in financial reporting, the ecosystem is really mature. There's market agreement about the need to have standards. There are globally recognized standard bodies, FASB and YASB. And there's stakeholder participation in the ongoing evolution of the standards and the practices. So companies, investors, and other stakeholders all fund and participate in the standard setting process and the governance around it. And therefore there can be appropriate regulation and enforcement established. And all this leads to acceptance and provides legitimacy. So the real question is how far are we on the journey to get widely understood and fit for use standards around impact measurement and performance. Is financial reporting the right model at all? Can it be done on a stepped basis? Should it be combined with financial reporting or should it be separate? What's out there now? Are there too many separate voices beginning to talk about this in the room? Or is there a collaboration of diverse voices working together to find appropriate standards, as we saw happen in the end with financial reporting. So there's lots of questions, but luckily we have a great panel and hopefully after the conversation, they'll help you to maybe understand the issues a bit better, perhaps give you some guidance, uh, maybe help to empower you as to how you would like to go about thinking about this topic. So given that we have different industry segments and we have different geographies, I think I'll open by asking our panelists, as practitioners themselves, what their current experience is. What do they see as best practice right now? Who or what is driving standardization in their segment, in their geography? Um, what do they use to guide their own organizations in this? And do they think it's meeting the demands of users? So whatever way they want to approach it, but to give us a feel as practitioners. So maybe given the order on the screen, I might start with you, Tim. Sure. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, or morning, depending where you are. Um, I know we've got some uh, some some um, random time zones on the call today, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think from our point of view, so just to, to give some context, um, so so the the fund that I'm involved with um, is a public equity impact fund. Um, so what we're trying to do uh, with that is ultimately try and better measure. Uh, the impacts, both positive and negative, of the enterprises that we're investing in, uh, and of course, also trying to measure and articulate uh, the impacts that we're trying to drive directly ourselves uh, through our engagement program with all of these businesses. Um, the, um, the the environment is without a doubt changing and improving rapidly. There's, we're definitely seeing things move in the right direction. I think, uh, Anya, you alluded to how historically perhaps the industry has had many different voices, many different standard setting um, bodies. Uh, I think what you've seen over the last few years and specifically the last year uh, is a lot of collaborative effort to try and unify that voice and to try and give uh, a much more harmonized message uh, to help to make it easier for uh, investors and 
uh, you know, to, to be able to, to understand what is the best practice in terms of being able to measure the impacts of, uh, of their investment. Um, I think you've also alluded to in your introduction that perhaps the next frontier now for how we think about uh, measuring impact is further alignment with how we think about measuring financials. And I think you know, what we would hopefully like to see now as we move forward is more conversion uh, between uh, measurement standards and, and financial uh, standards, perhaps in terms of uh, you know, the integrity of uh, the underlying data, but also in terms of finding more innovative ways of using the two in combination to make better ca capital allocation decisions. Um, you know, so for example, one thing we've, we've recently got involved with is, uh, is the Impact Management Project's uh, Impact Frontiers uh, mm -hmm. program, which is looking to do that, which is looking to align uh, along the concept of, of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of a risk reward and impact frontier, uh, the combination of, uh, of um, you know, looking at metrics on both sides of the aisle, if you like. Uh, to harmonize them more and that's that's what we've always tried to do through our process is uh you know try to better improve the alignment between how we think about companies ability to generate a positive impact uh, as well as of course what that means in terms of their ability thanks to that uh to to uh, to generate financial growth and uh, so that's what we're looking forward to now and i think that is somewhat made easier by the fact that if you are looking to invest in mission driven businesses uh, obviously a lot of these businesses a lot of these enterprises will typically get their value from you know, the, the, the environmental or social issue they're trying to address. Um, so that's the sort of uh, brief whistle-stop whistle view as to the way we see the world currently. Uh, I won't go into the details of, of, uh, of our framework. I'm sure we can have lots of discussion around uh, how you know, the, the details of what we're doing, but I'll, I'll let you direct in terms of the questions. Thank you, okay. Perhaps I'll go to you, Bruno, next. Oh yeah, thanks, Aime. So for me, I mean, I started in the ESG investing world, let's say, 16 years ago. And back then, it was just about, just about really avoiding the worst of the worst and really trying to keep your hands clean from the worst uh, corporate performers. So I, I'm really, you know, since then, I, I worked in development finance institutions, and that's when I sort of built this passion for impact uh, investing and impact measurement generally. But it's a really, really challenging field, I would say. You know, I think there is a, a fine line that you have to tread in impact a measurement and standardization between, um, I'm, I'm very passionate about standardization and comparability for sure, and value for money. I mean, this is something I worked on with the European Commission where we were thinking about blended finance envelopes uh, out of the commission and how do you judge value for money for the public money that you are putting on the table uh, to subsidize <coughs> in terms of the impact that you're going to achieve with that. That's extremely important for, for taxpayers to be able to show to taxpayers that you're pushing every dollar to, to, its, to its maximum impact there. And that's what, when this idea really hit me that it's really important to have this comparability. And I, I'd love to see a world where indeed we could pitch for um, impact investment mandates from asset owners and be able to be comparable from, from an impact perspective. That's one side of the coin. It's a fine line, though, between doing that and losing context. And I think it's it, impact is an extremely complex um, concept, and so it's it's very difficult to do to tread that fine line between um, measuring the right things, being comparable, being standardized, and actually being able to demonstrate appropriate uh, impact as well. So, for instance, we have the joint impact indicators now. I think it's a brilliant effort actually get us to uh, a set of indicators that's common throughout but you know very concretely you know I used to work on blended finance programs and there we were often faced with a choice okay well um, if we finance an SME lending program you're going to be getting lots of jobs and okay we can all measure jobs and you know what's get, what's going to be done there but you might not get an energy efficiency outcome and your energy usage might be terrible actually and from a climate perspective it might be awful so how do you balance those two things? And are you losing context if you're only measuring single-mindedly one thing? You know, it's important also not to lose sight of the other impacts. So what Tim said about understanding the negative and positive impacts and balancing that, I think that's, that's really fundamental. And it's still a difficult thing to do and an educational journey that we need to take our clients on 
uh, actually we need to go on ourselves. So actually together we need to learn this. What, what does it mean to have a positive net impact investment, to make a positive net impact investment? How do you standardize that? How do you compare them? That's a real challenge. Ross, what would you say to your own experience at the moment? Thank you, Anya, and uh, greetings from Sydney, uh, Australia. So great to be joining you from uh, the Southern Hemisphere here. Uh, look, this is a really interesting discussion, and I think we'd concur with the comments that have just been made around the challenges of doing uh, doing this well and doing it in a comparable way. In our context here in Australia, uh, as I think probably most people would be aware, we have we have a compulsory uh, pension system, but consumers have choice. And so there's some very interesting market factors that are driving, um, I guess, the narrative around a more robust uh, way of measuring and comparing impact, not so much driven from a regulatory standpoint, but actually from a consumer standpoint. And you know, I think that's actually a good thing if you have market forces that are lifting the bar uh, in terms of the way different funds are communicating or reporting on their impact. I think, generally speaking, the uh, the rigor or the science in the Australian market is not as advanced as other parts of the world. Um, perhaps in a couple of sectors, um, you, you've got some good 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 practice emerging, but in a lot of areas, you're still very much in the deeply qualitative narrative, and and you know, we're working hard to try and mature that for us as a pension fund that's been in the the impact and the ethical space for some years. Um, practice continues to mature. But I think, I mean, the comments just made resonate for me around the importance of context. Uh, in, in my career, have spent a significant amount of time in the development sector. And I, I think, you know, one of the observations that I have is we rightly think about how you try and mature and strengthen your reporting frameworks, your measurement frameworks. We, we need to be cautious that we don't approach development like a Gantt chart you know, where inputs go in one end and, and outputs come out the other. And if you double those inputs, then the outputs will double. Development is just not like that. It's multi-factor, context is critical. There's um, a huge number of development projects that are highly successful. There's equally a huge number of development projects that fail dismally for a whole range of context-based factors. And so to me, uh, you know, almost this narrative of this clash of cultures as the the, the, the appropriate um, intent around trying to build better standards and comparability, I think that's critically important. But I, I do caution that we, we may be trying to pursue an end game there that is simply unattainable or that is not realistic. And, and I guess there's going to be a sweet spot here where you can hopefully improve and strengthen your practice and you know the whole the language of return on investment and looking at outputs and, and so forth. But I... I'm just not sure that, you know, um, as I say, a, a, a highly rigid linear approach when you overlay that with development complexity, particularly in parts of the world where you may have a greater level of volatility in fragile states, for example, where, um, you know, there's deep needs, crit critical needs and, and deep need for investment. But, you know, you've got sovereign risk factors, you've got conflict factors, you have interfaith factors, there's any number of elements that could have a, have a, material um, impact on the actual delivery of, of positive outcomes for communities. And so it's challenging, I think would, would be my initial observation. Much, much work is needed. Good work to see what is maturing, but I just, I would caution that I think we, we need to not have an unrealistic view of the end game and the attainability of a, you know, almost like accounts-based approach. I think we'll, we'll come back, that's a very good point. We'll come back to you on that idea of a potential sweet spot and whether or not we can build outwards from that rather than necessarily trying to do everything in parallel. But before we do that, I might go to you, Kelly, having heard the voices and considering that you're sitting in the middle of the kind of impact measurement, trying to pull together standard bodies, et cetera. Um, what would your opening comments be in terms of what you can see developing that perhaps to the practitioners isn't yet fully obvious in terms of collaboration? Sure. Um, and greetings from the, the other side of the world, the Pacific coast of the U.S. Um, so, you know, 
so I've been I've been doing this work for almost 20 years and sitting on my on different sides of this discussion, whether it's on the the subject of reporting from a corporate side or from the consultant perspective, supporting corporates and investors to actually help implement um, looking at regulation um, when it comes to particular industries. And then and then more recently, um, you know, with the gin in the last 10 years, really being on the standard setting side. Um, and so one of the things, you know, so I, I sort of take that view as I look at the evolution of, of, of what we're discussing. And, and I personally see a sort of natural and, and healthy evolution taking place. Um, sustainability reporting and these concepts that we're talking about have been around for decades, but disclosure and, and this conversation, Ross, I mean, you know, your, your points really resonate with me. Um, it's, it's largely been, you know, asymmetrical in its rigor and practic practical utility. Um, and of course, it's, it's largely been voluntary. Um, but I think, you know, when we talk about the motivations um, over that sort of arc, um, you know, many have been motivated by a variety of, of, of different um, kind of perspectives. One, one might be, you know, marketing. Um, others, the competitive advantage. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, others by the ability, you know, as we heard in the keynote, to do more with money. Um, but those motivations really affect what folks are talking about focusing on um, and how they're making decisions based on, um, you know, what, what they're tracking and, um, and what they're discussing. Um, and of course, like naturally, you know, whole industries have grown up to serve this market. So we talk about the proliferation of tools and resources and standards, um, all derived to focus on those different motivating factors. Um, in the last 10 years or so, though, I would say the links between the sort of less vulnerable and stronger investments and better ESG risk management has become pretty, pretty obvious. Um, I mean, even in the last, I mean, 2020, if you just take that as a microcosm has, you know, has basically just exploded the, the narrative and, and, and sort of underscored it with dark black lines. Um, so, so for what I see as a move towards regulation or really raising the floor on expectations for, for use of capital seems very, very natural. Um, and what is following though, is a much deeper coordination amongst those standard setters who have grown up serving different motivated needs, um, such as ourselves to support that transition. So for example, um, and I, you know, I, I know that we'll talk about this a little bit more, we along with over 16 other standards bodies, and I know that number is probably terrifying to folks, like how are there actually 16 standards bodies, um, you know, even having this conversation um, and resource providers um, have, have been working together really to address the standards landscape confusion um, and really start to help sort of inform some of the discussions at the regulatory level um, you know, through, through that sorting. Um, the good news is, you know, for some, there's moves toward, there's a lot, there's many moves toward consolidation. Um, others are shifting to offering more implementation guidance, so serving that sort of gap. And mm -hmm. then others are really looking ahead um, at growing, a growing demand to actually demonstrate competitive beyond what I'll call the raising ESG disclosure floor. So if you really think, and this is a, you know, a natural arc um, that I think we see, um, you know, with the sort of, you know, the sort of rise um, of, of, of sort of different um, emphasis um, of markets. And the last thing I'll just quickly say, um, just to really put a, you know, fine point on this, 20 years ago, the whole discussion was around a single concept of materiality. Yeah. As we've, as over the last couple, like two decades, it's really been around um, you know, and I think other the, my fellow other panelists have been talking a lot about this, doing no harm with a move towards what can I do more with my money? That is where we are, I see, in terms of, of, of the rising floor. The next conversation, the next frontier, if we want to, you know, if we want to kind of frame it that way, is really how do I go, what do I, what does it look like beyond that? Um, and that those, that's really the, the space around, you know, how do I create positive change? Um, how do I remain sort of competitive in that environment and 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 share my uh, you know what I am doing um, towards that end? Thank you, Kelly. So let me ask you to discuss a little bit how far you think standardization should actually be taken. For example, 
do you feel there might be a need for a core set of globally agreed topics around which there would be globally agreed required information, much as we're seeing on the climate front, which is kind of leading from the front on this due to greater pull of interest from a whole different um, variety of stakeholders. Um, would that be one approach which would be step by step, whereby there could be different depths of information and standardization, which would be agreed by a collaborative effort amongst the different stakeholders and standard users? Does somebody want to kick off on, on that? I, I'll uh, just make some brief comments. I, I think that would be a very helpful to, to me, it's almost the view of you, you can't boil the ocean. And we've talked about the complexity and the importance of context. But equally, as, as Kelly has really highlighted, there's there's a critical need. And there's as the market matures and scales, you know, the, the challenge is that we, you know, we're, we are literally building the plane as we fly it um, as an asset owner. And we have an impact portfolio. I know for us, even to try to aggregate data across them, we have a multi-manager, multi-asset, multi-geography, multi-sector, it's very diverse. It's it's almost impossible. So, so the simple fact, if you could land at least a basic framework, it may not be perfect and you build from that, I think that would be a very positive kind of initial step. It wouldn't be perfect and it's not gonna meet every context, but I think, and again, we, we've already referenced some of the good work that's being done across the different groups. And I think everyone identifies the need. It's just how do you prosecute that in a, in a practical and sensible way? Take, take, take deliberate, but, but they, they monitor, they're not going to solve the whole thing, but, but would certainly improve um, the, the, the practice and the ability to just uh, build, build some rig around this. Jump in, jump in, guys, to, to, to speak to yeah, each other. I was going to say something about the EU taxonomy. So I think here, you know, it's, it's an example of, I think, quite admirable example of, of the European Union sort of taking the, the lead here and trying to define and set standards for what we consider to be positive environmental objective contribution, let's say, and defining that in a very detailed way. I think um, what where the jury's still out on this process is that it is it is being attached to regulation. And, you know, that can go one of two ways. It can either put people off massively because it's so difficult to comply with um, that it might not be that useful, or it can uh, really contribute to growing uh, the industry uh, in a significant way. Um, I, I personally think the second, the latter, or perhaps that's just my optimist self that, you know, it will help. Um, but I do worry a little bit that it's it's a regulatory tool, uh, and as such, you know, it, it can go horribly wrong at some point as well. At which point, you know, you might find lots of people throwing their toys out the pram and sort of just saying, "Right, we're not going to do this at all," or indeed lobbying for it to be scrapped altogether. And I think we already see a few worrying signs of that with uh, the inclusion of natural gas in the environmental objectives, climate objective, and nuclear power as well. And that was clearly a political process. You know, Germany got its gas in there and France got its nuclear power in there. So it's very obvious that it was a, it was a haggle and it was nothing to do with the actual underlying impact calculations, which is a little bit worrying uh, for, from that perspective. But I'm still hopeful that this will be, this is a, a step in the right direction, particularly you know, if, if we look at the very long run, you can imagine that people will, by default, start using this as a standard tool, because you might as well, because that's how your regulator is going to regulate you. But would you see something like that then as being equally possible, for instance, in supply chain management, or, you know, jobs actually taking other core areas and being able to apply the same kind of practitioner-led agreement, maybe together or not, with the regulators? How would you feel about that? Ania, if, if I can jump in here, um, just on two points um, before sort of answering your question directly. Um, you know, one thing, just to pick up on the regulatory point, um, I see, you know, regulation um, is, is a tool. Um, and what I see, what I see the utility of it, I, I, so Bruno, I, I also take your optimism. I take it kind of in, in a slightly different direction. 
Um, if we're raising the floor, if we're raising the floor on expectations for use of capital, for the, the role that business plays in society, if we're raising the floor, that opens up, um, you, you know, even if the floor is only slightly better than it was before, but that opens up a whole conversation about what else we can do on top of that. What, what are the additional, um, you know, again, competitive levers that open up for folks. So we're not sort of chasing, we're not chasing that floor um, as our competitive edge. We, we're actually looking beyond, we're actually looking towards, you know, creating positive change on top of, on top of, you know, basic risk management or, and I, I shouldn't even call it basic. I mean, it's, it's an elevated sense of risk management. Um, so I, I take the moves as optimistic. And then Anya, just to your, your other question about what, you know, what can be standardized and is, is that even a good direction? Um, what I really think, you know, we've, the panel has, has been talking a lot about context and comparability. Um, and what I think that really means is, you know, for us to kind of put to bed the debate or discussion around core metrics and indicators, um, and really for us to um, coalesce around, you know, what those are by different industry verticals, by different, you know, effects, by, by, diff by those things. And I, I see the work of the U taxonomy helping in that direction, the work of the standard setters helping in that direction. But what that opens up, and I think this is what's really exciting, is that opens up a discussion for creating um, basically sense making. So how do we make sense of that data? Because right now we can't, because it's chaotic and all over the place and it's asymmetrical. But once you standardize that underlying information, then we can, and this gets to your point about, you know, moving towards the, the sort of financial analog, then we can start talking about benchmarks and we can start talking about, you know, performance. Um, and we can actually start talking about ways that we actually can make sense of that information so that we can make better investment decisions. So that's the kind of trajectory I think that we're on, um, you know, with this discussion. I'm, I'm keen to comment on those same two points actually as well that Kelly's yeah, just please. made. Um, you know, so I think from the point of view of, of the regulatory side, I'm going to again, re-echo the optimism there because I think at, at the bare minimum, what it is going to do and, and using the example of the EU taxonomy, uh, given that's, you know, so imminent, I think ultimately at the very least, it will compel more enterprises to report and it will improve disclosure. Um, we might not see the numbers we like, but we should get more transparency. Um, you know, so I think you know, putting my optimistic hat on, I think that is, is what I would expect as a sort of minimum positive outcome, if you like, from the, the move to, to, um, to implement regulations such as this one. Um, I like uh, uh, Kelly's term of, of, of sort of sense making then and, and putting context around what we get in terms of this disclosure. Um, you know, and I think, you know, I wonder whether there, there should be more of a, a focus now to go back to as well to Ross's point about context uh, on perhaps standardizing frameworks to analyze that and to, and to expose that context, you know, so tools like, you know, the, 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 the sort of five dimensions of impact, for example, are a good way of giving some meaning to what is otherwise an input or an output statistic. Um, you know, and, and I think you know, one of the challenges we've we've constantly tried to address is, uh, you know, when you find you know some impacts in particular are very standardized, so they are very by definition very easy to uh, yeah. to standardize, um, whereas some are, are much more idiosyncratic. You know, so if you look at healthcare, for example, uh, unmet needs are different in different treatment areas within healthcare. So, for example, ca counting treated patients, um, you know, is is uh, is ultimately not going to mean the same thing in the same area without giving context around that particular impact. Um, and, and again, it varies by geography, as I'm sure we all know, you know, giving a commoditized uh, healthcare treatment in, uh, you know, in a, a low or middle income nation is going to have a very different impact than it is, of course, in an OECD nation. You know, so I think um, I completely echo the points on, on context. Um, and I think the industry um, perhaps what I have seen, uh, and this is purely uh, anecdotal and observational, um, I think the easiest thing to do when putting context is to, you know, the, the, the marketing department often does like to get uh, get involved and it's, it's very easy to focus on, you know, case study sort of work where you can only bring out 
um, you know, positives and everyone wants to put their best foot forward. I think that's natural um, without giving the full accounts. And I think I think perhaps a, a, a more qualitative framework and standardization around not just the actual measurement KPIs, but the contextualization of those KPIs could be perhaps a great next step to allow uh, impact investors to, 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 you know, in a more standardized uh, way, be able to give that qualitative context to those quantitative measurements. And in terms of trying to think of what pieces of the financial reporting um, ecosystem, what elements might be adaptable toward that end, what would you see as being areas that one can kind of hang up in front of of oneself or the standard setters can hold to and think, oh yeah, we'd like something to look like that, but describe impact. Do you think, do you ever think about that? So I, I think there are already glimpses of that. And I think, you know, as Kelly said, there, there is a, a lot of work um, around providing guidance um, and looking at cause and effect relationships rather than just focusing purely on outputs. And I think that we've seen that emerge over the last few years. Uh, we're big fans, um, for example, of, uh, of um, a small organization here in the UK called FutureFit, um, which, uh, which give you a FutureFit benchmark, which basically helps you contextualize the impacts, both positive and negative of companies um, in allowing investors to better understand, as I said, that sort of cause and effect um, and ultimately what good practice should be in particular industries, uh, you know, because otherwise, um, you know, just looking at, at at a number again, coming back to the point of context here, um, you know, in, in, on its own can be perhaps misleading and, and not lead you to making the best decisions. So I think what we're, we're already seeing that on you to your question, we're seeing uh, standard setting bodies and benchmarking organizations try to put more effort behind uh, the depth of, of and the same thing for Iris, you know, obviously, we've, we've been users of Iris um, ever since we've been doing this. And uh, um, you know, Iris has, has, is fantastic now at giving, um, uh, you know, much better explanations around KPIs and the and how they should be not just implemented, but also used and contextualized. Um, you know, so, so I think that it's already happening. Um, but I think, again, going back to Anya, your, your opening gambit, it, it needs to be drawn together now. And we're, we've only just started to see that. And do you think it's drawn together by practitioners themselves? Is it drawn together by potential users of the information? Who exactly is going to make the difference in terms of really ensuring we get that usability from what's happening race standards right now? I, I think maybe to comment a bit on our context here, I think there's gonna be a range of factors that will, will drive that. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, interestingly, in our context where we have this compulsion, a pot compulsory pension system, but consumers can choose, there is actually, there's a market shaping dynamic to that. And, you know, fund A versus fund B increasingly are wanting to be positioned as, you know, at minimum socially aware, but ideally far more progressive. And so, and look, fascinatingly in Australia, a lot of that has accelerated hugely, even in, even through COVID, actually, you know, we, we've seen a number of uh, very large pension funds rebranding, but they're rebranding with uh, with, val with a values based orientation, aware super or spirit super, or you know, so part of that. There's just simply market forces and consumers who are saying, and and it's probably a certain demographic of consumers, arguably probably more you know a younger generation who are you know age you know early twenties. What's this thing called a pension that I need to sign up to and you know, I haven't thought about retirement a long way off, but actually I, I, that's interesting, a value proposition that says my money can be doing everything it should be doing, good returns, low fees, but actually not only doing the bad stuff, out of the bad stuff, but be targeting good stuff. So there's, there's an interesting consumer dynamic that is shaping that. Now, the challenge there, of course, is that that will be coming from a very much the, um, you know, the, 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 the story, the qualitative, the, the case study stuff uh, that, that Tim just mentioned. And so that's, but that's an interesting if you can leverage that well, uh, you know, the investment market listens. In Australia, our pension system is a $3 trillion system. It's bigger than our gross national product. It's massive. If you can start seeing that capital moving towards market opportunity because consumers are voting with their feet, 
that provides a profound opportunity. Now, of course, there's the risk of greenwashing, impact washing, and that, you know, funds are rebranding themselves as all suddenly highly progressive. But and there's, there's risk, but I think there's profound opportunity there. So to answer your question on your around the shapers, that's a good example, I think, where you have a consumer voice that is potentially quite significant, certainly in our context, and I suspect in some others, a whole range of other shapers that I'm, that I'm sure others can comment on as well. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say on this one that, uh, yeah, I think it's a, it needs to be a joint effort to a certain extent, right? Uh, I think there's a role, I, I'm always hoping for an interesting conversation with regulators on this. I'm always hoping for an interesting conversation with policymakers on it. Yeah. Most importantly, I want a really good conversation with clients, much to, you know, the chagrin of my commercial department sometimes they don't they you know it's human to want simple solutions and to want shortcuts and to want just the new, the numbers and, and the quick answer but i think the the real value here lies in us talking about it so you know to give you a very live example there are now funds out there claiming that only lend do mortgages in the netherlands and they claim that they are impacting on sdg1 no poverty and, uh, you know, to me, that just doesn't make any sense at all. But it also doesn't make sense if a client comes to me and says, I want your mortgage fund to be uh, impactful or Article 8 or Article 9 or whatever that might be that they're after. I think, to me, that, that's not very valuable feedback. So what we always try to do is sit down and have that conversation. And I can tell you, I've had the whole range of conversations from the simple, just get it done and I want it to be green to uh, a full com sit down conversation about, okay, what is it that you want this fund to achieve? And that, those are the really valuable conversations. What is it that you want your investments to actually do for you? What are your expectations here? And I think this is where the industry starts to really change when we actually have to sit down and have those difficult conversations with our clients, with regulators, with others as well, about what it is, what are the expectations and how do we set them up in our policy objectives? How do we monitor them? How do we report back on them? Um, these are tough conversations, but I think we, we need to have them. And managing to standardize the expect, to meet yeah. their expectations, but with some form of standardization in the response. Ideally, yes. That really yeah. can compare. And I hope that clients and can... Yeah cutting through the obfuscation and ask for that, you know, no, that, that they, they read that report that I mentioned that's saying that they contribute to SDG 1 and actually cut through that and ask that fund manager, hold on a minute, on the right metrics, how are you actually performing on, on the energy efficiency of your portfolio, for example, if it's a mortgage fund, right? So these are the kinds of conversations that still need to happen uh, with, with clients. And with the Sorry, I think you were keen to say something. <laughs> yes, I, I actually really want to punctuate something Ross said. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you if you look at, um, if you even, you know, again, I mentioned earlier, the, the obviously the events of 20, 2020, but I think one of the major drivers that we're going to look back and we're going to say, this was sort of the expediting factor is, um, you know, around the world, uh, not just folks in the financial you know, space, not just folks in the corporate space, but regular people starting to say, you know, I, a couple of things, like I distrust institutions. Mm -hmm. um, I want more from them. And I want, I want to know that I'm not being lied to. Um, so how do you, how do you, how do I know that I'm not being lied to? Um, you know, that, that's sort of on the, the, the sort of negative side, but also, um, you know, I, I, the word woke, comes to mind, wokeism, um, you know, folks realizing that um, the, the very real issues around, you know, the most vulnerable, climate change, all of these things are very, very real issues um, that are sort of in our face and realizing that, that, that we need to be doing something about it. And also realizing that, you know, through the power, you know, Ross, you were talking about pension funds in the US, one of the things that's really disappointing to me is that um, our, our retirement plans, our 401ks, very still do not have great, just basic socially responsible um, offerings. It's, it's totally ridiculous. Um, and, and, you know, folks are waking up to, you know, the fact that that's a real problem. Um, and then you have also, again, 
from the, you know, basically expedited by the effects of last year, business leaders around the world demanding for a sustainable and inclusive recovery. So you take all those things together and you have market conditions that are absolutely pushing us towards a more consolidated, more focused view of what does that actually mean. Um, and then the other thing I'll just say is, you know, the real transition of wealth. So the, the, the point about like values-based, um, you know, investing, uh, not to put that in capital letters, but, but more a conceptual idea, um, you know, the transition of wealth to, you know, generations of folks who define themselves by the meaning they derive from the work that they do. Um, so all of this, you know, points to in the next five, 10 years, a very strong shift in the way that financial markets are going to have to be thinking about how they're allocating. I think that's an interesting point. And I think I would echo your comment in terms of the, the rate of change that the last year and COVID have really brought about. And particularly in terms of people demanding more information. I think there has had to be a lot more transparency both about what's been happening on the pandemic side and also on now on what's happening on the vaccination side. I think policymakers and governments are being forced in this case to give more information than maybe they would have been accustomed to giving about centralized situations like that. And so once that door to asking for more information is opened, maybe that, maybe that makes um, really quite a difference. And this is just a, a comment too on your on to build on what Kelly's just said there. I, and, and herein lies the tension of trying to build frameworks of consistent standardized measurement, which takes time and it's complex and so yeah. forth. Um, you know, it's you, you have this latent but but growing opportunity in terms of market forces, and there's a whole range of them. And, and obviously, even in the geographies represented on this call and this panel and, and those participating, I'm sure they're all lots of different drivers, but there are some deeply common themes. And my nervousness, to be honest, as much as I say, look, there's a tremendous opportunity if you've got market forces that have got asset owners, asset managers saying, gosh, we, we want to get a piece of that because people are starting to vote with their feet. You may well find yourself very quickly overtaken with, you know, just this volume of capital that rushes in, you know, good, that's good. You know, you've got socially aware, focused investing, but if you don't have the infrastructure or even the, the basic building blocks of a framework, then, you know, consumers will go with the sexiest message, you know, you, it'll be in the hands of the marketers to just tell the story and the, whoever's got the deepest pockets and can spin it the best will, will get the votes. And so there's this tension here. And that, that's why I think there is, I mean, I don't want to say it's an urgency, but it, there is a burning platform to materially mature and progress the thinking around standardization, but not in a way that, we're trying to aim for perfection here because I think if that's what you're going to aim for, actually you're going to be overtaken. You know, you, you're just going to be we're in the hands of the marketers, and and it's a and it's a it's a free reign there. And and I think that's a real missed opportunity to see capital deployed thoughtfully, intentionally for profoundly good purposes. So yeah, interesting set of set of timing considerations around that. And if I, sorry, go on, go on. Just to continue from that, I think, you know, that, that is one of the real challenges which, which we've kind of alluded through throughout this talk is that, you know, there's there's a danger of falling into a trap where we over standardize. Yes. And then ultimately, you know, I think I can't remember who said it. I think it was Bruno or Ross alluded to, you know, when you when you focus only on the output, you you you, you stop requiring the transparency behind what got you to that output. And that makes it easier then for the industry to act in a more cynical way and in a more, you know, in, in, in a way which, you know, where the transparency isn't provided because, you know, you just look at the easy number, the easy number tells you what you uh, want to know. So I think, I think there is this balance, again, to go back to the opening uh, points which, which were made, I think there is a balance between, um, you know, getting to a, that, that, that sort of happy stage of, uh, you know, yes, we have a standardized uh, measures for the industry generally, but also at the same time, you know, we give, uh, you know, th there is a requirement to, to disclose as much as possible and to be as transparent as possible. And if we wanted to speak to our audience and maybe just give them one key piece of advice or information and guidance in terms of something that you can see happening on the standardization front, much as you were discussing, Kelly, that they should keep their eye on, that will help them to see how it's evolving, 
How would each of you um, speak to the audience on that? Maybe you want to kick off, Kelly? Sure. Um, what I would look to is, um, so actually, so Tim, what you're saying is is really resonating loudly with me. And I think everybody's been talking for the last, um, you know, 45 minutes about transparency. Um, and I agree that an overfixation on hyper standardization across the board is probably not the direction that is most productive. But what, so two things, um, I will underscore what I said earlier. I think the underlying data absolutely needs to be standardized. Yeah. The only way financial markets function is with a shared understanding of basic financial indicators. So that is, that to me is just, it's a must have. But the other area around transparency, I think what we're going to see emerge um, with, you know, with this discussion about context and with this, dis this discussion about um, differentiation is, is really a shift towards a focus on, you know, basically th three, you know, th three factors, profile, practice, and performance. On the profile front, it's who's doing what, literally, there is no place to actually just find who is doing what? And, and I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of an obvious gap in the market. Um, you know, where do you go find asset owners who are focusing on the same thing you are, asset managers who are focusing on the same thing you are? There is no single place. So who's doing what? What are they doing? So to this point about practices and, and just like radical transparency around practices, um, I think we're going to see a shift towards greater transparency around, around that. And this, this goes to the whole, um, you know, what I was talking about earlier, just trust in institutions. Folks wanna know what you're doing with their money. They, this is not even about performance at this point. It's just, what are you actually doing? Um, and how are you managing it? And how are you caring for it? And then finally, of course, results. Um, transparency about results, you know, accountability follows, accountability for results follows, but, but just basic, basic transparency around how is that money performing? How, how is it performing? Um, and you know, all of these things, they seem like no brainers at this point. It seems like, why haven't we done this yet? But, um, but this is where I really see the, the next major move um, is, is what we'll, we'll see sort of shake out. Okay. Bruno, would you like to hop in? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think for, for us, what we always say to clients is, is take your time um, to understand the area well. Um, when you open an impact report, just because it looks beautiful and some of them look really beautiful, doesn't mean that there's some real impact behind there and ask questions. You know, one impact fund I recently, who I really respect, it's a fantastic brand, I won't say the name, um, open their fact sheet, it's an impact fund and it's, you know, has a large position in Diageo. No explanation for that. Um, Boost company, okay, where is the impact there? You know, so ask the questions, I think is, is the key uh, message that I always say to clients. If something doesn't look right, you know, ask the questions and ask people to justify themselves. In terms of watching where the regulation is going and where the standards are going, you know, for us, it's really we're watching the EU first and foremost with the tax. So, interestingly, Bruno, I might hop in there because a question has just come through. Do you agree that the EU SFDR reporting obligations offer a good bedrock for regulated social impact reporting, um, especially in terms of identifying negative consequences? And this did come up earlier about the need to have some form of transparency and standardization around negative consequences as well as the positive side. So what do you think about that, Bruno? So to Ross's point, it would be wonderful if everybody understood that it's an imperfect start to, to, to what is a very, you know, very uh, laudable objective. Um, and I'm not sure that everybody has that understanding. So several Clients have talked to us already about, um, you know, why isn't your fund in Article 8? Why isn't it in Article 9? Where is your principal adverse impact disclosures and blah, blah, with, that, with limited or no understanding of what that actually means and what they actually want out of it. You know, very tellingly, Article 8 says, I promote ESG characteristics in my fund. If a client tells me, 
I want my font to be Article 8. My next question is, well, okay, well, what ESG characteristic do you want? And then they don't have an answer for that. <laughs> so it's, it, you know, we need, it, we need to have a bit more understanding of what the regulation is trying to do. With the adverse impact stuff that's in there, my personal worry is that it's not linked at all to mandated disclosures from, from corporates. Some of it is okay, and some of it is just nowhere near it. And it's very disappointing that that legislation came out completely not in sync with non-financial disclosure regulation from Europe. I mean, okay, and that would only apply to European companies anyway. Global companies wouldn't have to, uh, to subscribe to it, but still it would help if at least European companies had to disclose the same indicators that I have to disclose to my clients. It would be, make life a lot easier. Plus, it's, it's kind of missing, it's treating the chunk of the market for sure in terms of corporate issuers, right? Equity and, and corporate bonds. But there's a huge chunk of the market that's not in those asset classes that is a bit lost, quite frankly. They don't know what to do to comply with SFDR. It's not written for them at all. It's not even thought about in SFDR. So there's quite a few enhancements that need to come over time. But it's not dissimilar to how PRI started out, right? When Whenever PRI started out, everybody signed up and nobody knew how we would actually go about and implement it. Nowadays, it's fabulous. It's really well done. So, you know, it takes time to get there, but um, we will need to, I'm, I'm very keen to see how the regulators build up their capacity to guide us properly on how to comply with this legislation. I, overall, I think it's, it's a good step in the right direction. And it gives something around which the conversation can be had. Yeah, for sure. Which is always good, even it's if you get a red line through 90% of it. Um, yeah. You probably have something that you'd like to maybe comment on that, but also, to where you would, you know, back to the guide the audience, what would you encourage them to kind of look at before? Yeah, I mean, I agree with most of the points that Bruno um, made. I think, you know, the question now, um, you know, again, putting my optimistic hat on, uh, as you've just alluded to, it's, it's a good start. And it, it gives you, a, as you say, a, a sort of, you know, a place to start the conversation. Um, governance will be key. Uh, and how it's applied will be key. Uh, so that's the big question mark. Again, I'm gonna I'm going to try and re reserve judgment until we've you know it's been up and running for a, for a year or, so, or or longer. But uh, you know I, I think there have already been um, you know remarks of um, it. Uh, you know, for example, funds classifying themselves as as nine, which perhaps you wouldn't have expected to, or or or, um, or otherwise. So I, I think we'll um, we'll see how ultimately it looks in a year's time and whether more needs to be done perhaps to, to guide and to govern uh, the implementation of SFDR. Um, I think more generally um, in terms of guidance to the audience, you know, we we, we haven't talked a great deal about, um, you know, auditing and, and verification. And I think, you know, that is, you know, right now the industry is is, is lacking in that respect. So managers such as ourselves have to self-verify uh, verify. Uh, and and what we try to do about it the way we try to get around this problem ultimately is by being as transparent as possible and publishing as much as we can uh, particularly around the nature of how an impact is delivered not just publishing metrics but explaining our theory of change uh, explaining why a particular company or a particular solution sold by a company can actually drive a positive outcome against particular sdg targets and explaining as well what the negative potential consequences or impacts because nothing is perfect nothing is without negative impact um are going to be you know so that there are no nasty surprises to investors um you know when when something does happen um excuse me <laughs> um ultimately though i you know i i think the you know to the question of um you know whether this is something driven by regulators or something which is driven by standard setting i think it's going to be a collective effort and i think you know i i think standard setting bodies have done a great amount it now comes down to customers to demand more and managers to give more to, to supply more in terms of their transparency and in terms of the disclosures that they give um you know to, to make it a to, to to move things in the right direction and ross Look, for me, I would suggest, I mean, everyone's, whichever hat you're wearing, whether it's an asset owner or a manager or in, a, in a, an advisor or something similar, I'd say two words, courage and humility. The first one, courage to um, wrestle meaningfully with 
your respective portfolios. I think societal expectations are shifting. I think investment expectations are shifting and you do have this convergence we mentioned earlier of, of uh, you know, what is good for society and what is good for investment. Again, there's a massive opportunity there. So, so, so courage to ask those hard questions. The second one is about humility though. And, and look for us, and we, we, we have about 30,000 members. We're not a massive pension fund, about $2 billion of funds under management, but we have highly engaged members. And I'd say the whole impact story and how we measure it, it's a bit like sand in the oyster. And, and I'd say if you're going out there with a very flashy, you know, this is all simple and look at, you know, the, the, we, we've talked about the complexity that's here. I actually think there's a really profound engagement opportunity with, with clients, with consumers, that you bring them on a journey of understanding development is not straightforward. We haven't got it all worked out. Um, we are learning as we go. And so even for us, as we try and tell our story, you know, an impact report, all those sorts of things, we really try to do that in a way that is instructive and that points to as many of the points where we've either failed or have not, where we've still got a whole lot further to go. And interestingly, the, the, the reaction from consumers is, is actually overall embracing, is warm. Pe people respond more to the, you know, it's almost this negativity bias that human nature has or this skepticism. And I, and I actually think that drives actually quite a unique engagement opportunity. There's this paradox, you know, the more real and transparent you are, the more likely people are to buy into the story and what you're actually doing. So yeah, courage, courage and humility would be the, the, the points I'd highlight. I don't see any more questions from the floor. So just, you know, there is another moment if anybody does have a burning question they'd like to send through. But I think if I were to try to sum up where you are as a panel in terms of your opinions on this and what you might say to the floor. So definitely data standardization, I think is at the core. There's a required level of standardization in order to meet the needs for transparency from the different categories of users. But I think you would feel that it might not need to go the whole financial reporting hog because you do have that um, dilemma in terms of different users, different needs, the reality of reporting certain information and not other. But I get the impression that you feel, particularly in your comments, Kelly, that the standard setters out there, many though they are, are already moving toward recognizing the need to come together so that users of the information can actually find it worth, worth, worth something and that they can actually compare, come to compare, albeit that we still need to have the stories and the depth of understanding um, around that. And though we don't want to be led by regulation, it does tend to add to the discussion. I think particularly on any mis-selling. Um, God knows we've had enough mis-selling in other segments of the industry. So it's something that you know consumers are very familiar with now and it goes back to the trust point. And so having some level of regulation that puts something out there for the users, for the clients to actually build a conversation around and to get educated around is helpful. And again, we do seem to be seeing some move um, in that direction. So I'd say quite a lot to be optimistic about, but let's not expect something that looks like financial reporting in the near future, because that really may not be what serves the needs of the user. Thank you, Wayne. Great. That Thank was... You. That was fantastic. Uh, you've already preempted my normal wrapping up question to ask the moderator for a great summary of the panel, but you've just done that. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you and, and conscious of time, I'm afraid we will have to go to the next agenda item, but not without first thanking Ross Piper, giving him a special thanks, the CEO of Christian Super for dialing in in the middle of the Australian night, as we can see in your background. So uh, I wish you a good night and we carry on. Thank you. <laughs>